Hello, welcome to Z-Day London 2013. <clears throat> um, your presence here today is the first important step in raising uh, awareness about a the possibility of a better world, so thank you all very much for coming. My name's James Phillips, I'm a member of the uh, London chapter and the UK lecture team for the Zeitgeist Movement. <clears throat> as an organisation which seeks a radical paradigm shift in our conduct as a species on this planet, the Zeitgeist Movement is often asked an incredibly important question. How do we get from here to there? Or the question of transition. This year's Z-Day has been designed to address this question in both form and content, and that's why this presentation is entitled Joining the Dots, Drawing the Picture of Transition. I'd encourage you to write down your questions throughout the day. Um, as schedule permitted, we should have time for a Q&A at the end um, uh, by a panel from the movement, as well as a short one at the end of each speaker as well. <clears throat> so, why all the fuss? Why do we even exist as an organisation in the first place? Well, because something is very wrong in our world, I'm afraid. For in a world where 1% owns 40% of the world's wealth, 50% live on less than $3 a day, 80% on less than 10, and a sixth of the planet's human population are starving to death, something is obvious. Our current approach to running human society on a global scale in an effort to meet human needs is clearly not working. And if for some reason you think that this is acceptable or that we're generally moving in the right direction, then I'm afraid you still face an evolutionary precipice on an ecological level in the wake of huge levels of resource depletion in the insane quest for infinite growth on a finite planet. For the facts are that we will need two Earths by 2030 to keep up our current rates of consumption. The last remaining rainforest could be consumed in less than 40 years. Species are going extinct at a thousand times their normal rate due to human activity. Over 70% of the world's fish species are disappearing at an alarming rate due to overfishing, and 99% of all resources harvested from nature in the United States ends up as waste within six weeks. So, sorry if you were hoping for a nice chirpy little opening to your day, but I'm afraid the gloves are off. To call this wasteful joke of a system and economy is an affront to our intelligence. An economy is supposed to economise. What we have does the polar opposite and would be better referred to as an anti-economy. <clears throat> the backbone of this structure is something called cyclical consumption. This is basically the extraction, manufacturing and exchange of goods and services at an ever-increasing rate in order to speed up the circulation of money in the system and keep the so-called economy growing. Any other organism that behaved in such a way towards its life host would be referred to as cancer. And as for claiming that we have a civilization, I would say that we would surely have to be civilized first, right? And a world that spends what it would cost to feed all the starving people on it for a year in just eight days on war doesn't seem all that civil to me. I think astronomer and author Carl Sagan put it best when he said, we are one organism <coughs> sharing um, one planet and an organism at war with itself is doomed. And this is why we exist. The Zeitgeist Movement is an educational sustainability advocacy group engaged in spreading positive value orientations to the surrounding culture. For when you step back far enough to look for the causal mechanisms behind these effects, we find that these issues are not due to some rogue flaw in human nature or a mere transgression of the patchwork system of problem solving referred to as the law. Rather, they are symptoms of and in direct relation, relational response to the premises of the current socio-economic paradigm itself. And it's the culmination of our overall cultural values that support this structure. Without a shift in these, I'm afraid there will never be a workable alternative. So the clue is in the name, really, as the term zeitgeist refers to the intellectual, moral and cultural climate of an era. And movement refers to motion or change. Therefore, the Zeitgeist Movement seeks a transition away from the values of rampant consumption as a measure of social health, resource theft, corruption, and monopolistic collusion towards environmental and social sustainability, collaboration, and access abundance on a global scale in an effort to meet human, the human needs of the entire population. We recognize that the world is, in fact, one synergistic, interconnected organism and must be treated as such if we are to face the many challenges that lie ahead. 
So what's the plan for these bold claims? Well, to understand this, we first of all need to do a little bit of back history. <clears throat> the movement was founded in 2008 by documentary filmmaker Peter Joseph and was initially the communication arm of another organization, the Venus Project, the founder of which was industrial designer, inventor, and futurist Jacques Fresco. He saw way back in the days of the Great Depression that if a new system of planetary management was not employed, then we were simply setting the stage for our own destruction. The system he's worked on his whole life uh, on designing that the movement advocates and promotes could be referred to as a resource-based economy. A resource-based economy, or natural law economy as it's sometimes known, is an economic system like no other before it. It's the first to directly apply a completely different decision-making method towards the management of society. It's not derived from some random think tank or egotistic philosophical or political opinion, but rather from the most accurate and empirical decision-making method we have ever come to know of as a species, the scientific method. Science is quite simply the best approach we have for predicting future events and making more accurate measurements of the physical reality we all share. It's completely devoid of human opinion or ego and as shown here is simply asking a question, doing some research, developing what you consider to be a reasonable answer, otherwise known as a hypothesis, devising an experiment to test that hypothesis through empirical observation and measurement, and drawing a conclusion from the analyzed test results. Others can then uh, repeat your experiment to verify its validity. It never proposes the truth, it merely seeks it and updates itself through new findings. For all the intellectualized snobbery that often follows science around, it's actually remarkably simple and is in fact the most commonly used decision-making method in existence. It's simply environmental feedback, and in this way we are all scientists on one level or another, for we engage in it when we run the hypothesis carried out in the previous experiment, when opening a door, going to the fridge, or driving a car. Let's throw in a new factor. Let's say the car doesn't start when you turn the key. Is that A, due to demons possessing it? Or B, because there's a mechanical fault of some kind? It's obviously B. So what's the appropriate decision in this situation? Is it to operate on the logic of the character Basil Fawlty from the sitcom Fawlty Towers and attack it with the remnants of a tree? <laughs> or to decipher the most probable area of causality, aka problem solving? <clears throat> which is essentially what the scientific method is, a problem solving method by which we arrive at decisions rather than making them. So what's the difference between arriving at a decision and making one? Take a plot of land. Four families live on the plot of land and they decide to plant a fruit tree for food. Which place is the best place for them to plant the fruit tree? A, B, C or D? Now, B is the one screaming out at you, right? But in this figurative example, at least, it's actually D. You see, the scientific method states that you have to take into account all the known variables interacting on the tree's ability to produce the highest amount of food. So that's the pH level of the soil, the best place for irrigation, sunlight, and so on. So by using such a different decision-making process towards planetary management, we'll naturally arrive at an extremely different perspective in social design than the one we have now. But it's not like it would be the first time we've had to update our understandings as a species. For fight changes we may, it is in fact the only constant. Remember that we once thought the world was flat, the center of the universe, Drilling holes in heads would relieve migraines. <clears throat> Slavery was fine. And the Roman Empire would last forever. Needless to say that our understandings of, of what the truth is has had to change over time, and there's no reason to think that this trend has suddenly stopped. So with this new decision-making process in play, let's run through a thought exercise to learn the basics of how a resource-based economy, or RBE, works. <clears throat> Imagine that we discover a new Earth, identical to our planet, but untouched by humans, and we can move all the, planets, uh, all the humans rather, from this planet to our new Earth. Where would we start in an effort to build our new society? Well, wouldn't it make sense first to discover what we have on board our planetary spaceship by doing a resource survey? So this can be done now with existing technologies such as satellites and sensors and so on. 
This would take into account all relevant factors pertaining towards optimal global resource management, but let's take the lifeblood of society as an example of this approach, energy. We would survey where and what the energy potentials are and plot them into a chart listing all the relative retroactions and potentials of those mediums such as output, renewability, pollution and alike, and then draw inference as to the most efficient and strategic approach to meet our energy needs. This would be based on our most up-to-date understanding and technological approaches at the time, of course. And this is where the news is very good, because we have nothing but an abundance of clean energy right at our fingertips. A 2005 Stanford University study uh, found that by harnessing just 20% of the potential of wind energy, we could supply half of all the world's current energy needs. With the potential exponential increase in nanotechnology when applied to the harnessing of solar radiation, it's estimated that this medium alone could supply the Earth with all its energy needs a thousand times over in the not too distant future. Which isn't really that surprising considering that the energy from the sun's rays hitting the surface of the Earth is 10,000 times our energy use. <coughs> Tidal has been estimated to supply 34% of the UK's energy demand, for example and wave power could supply 50% of all the world's energy needs if applied strategically. And then there's geothermal energy, which been, has been estimated to contain enough energy potential to power the world for the next 4,000 years if applied with this systems theory approach to planetary management. So now we have an abundance of clean renewable energy. Next we need a system to manage and distribute this energy. The most effective tools we have for this job are computers and artificial intelligence. Computers can process trillions of bits of information a second and help us to arrive at more appropriate decisions in our economic operations. We would, of course, look to localise energy production based on proximity of the surrounding potentials, um, with redundancy protocols built in at every stage of development. So if there's a drop of supply in one energy medium, then another can pick up the slack automatically. There's no need to vote for it, it's self-evident, and would react in much the same way your body's nervous system does. Whilst this may have some complex variables, it's really nothing more than a glorified calculator. This example given with energy would serve as a proxy for the method we would use in all other areas of the economy. In fact, this approach is already used, albeit in often unappreciated and detached ways, <coughs> such as restocking at shopping centres, the ink level notifications on your personal printer and the thermostat in your fridge. All we are doing is scaling this practice out to make sure that we are maintaining maximum efficiency and a balanced load economy. So let's run down some, a brief list of some other essentials that need to be met for human society on our new planet Earth. Food, water, housing, transportation, uh, general safety and education and culture. When using a scientific method applied to agriculture, we find that our current methods of food cultivation are environmentally destructive, outdated, and very often detrimental to human health. By the use of hydroponics and aquaponics, we can produce an abundance of fresh organic food for everyone and are able to do so locally with a negligible effect on the environment. Hydroponics is the growing of plants in organically nutrient-rich water, which uses one-tenth that of modern agricultural methods. Um, and when grown in rotating cylinders like this, we're able to use less light and can use gravity to trick the plants into growing up to five times faster than current farming methods. Aquaponics combines the cultivation of aquatic animals in uh, tanks with hydroponics in a symbiotic system. So wastewater is filtered out from the aquatic tanks to the hydroponic system, where the plants then filter out the vital, uh, the vital nutrients needed and return the clean water back to the aquatic tanks. What I've just described is a symbiotic system of design, otherwise known as joined up thinking. Something sadly lacking in our current system, I'm afraid. Um, <clears throat> and if this was housed in a building with one acre floor space, 12 stories high, then um, completely automated with the use of AI and robotics, it could produce as much agricultural yield as 400 acres of farming land and with a faster crop rotation time as well. So when it comes to food cultivation, we really do need to uh, grow up. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I've got one more. <laughs> the fact that we're facing water shortage issues in the coming years on a planet 71% covered in the stuff should tell enough of its own story as to how ridiculously moronic our current practices are. But are there more effective ways of producing clean drinking water? Yes. 
There are a few, but the most popular one is desalination, which removes excess salt and other minerals from polluted, sea water, uh, polluted or seawater to make fresh drinking water. There's also a new device called an atmospheric water generator that can actually produce fresh drinking water from extracting it uh, from the moisture in the air around you. <clears throat> around half of all non-renewable resources used on this planet go to construction. And in the UK, for example, 40% of that goes to waste. Fortunately, robust design and delivery of buildings is now a reality through advents such as 3D printing and mechanization. Here are some designs from the Venus Project of homes <coughs> that are built with um, sustainable practice in mind from the outset. Energy conservation is built in at the design stage, utilizing such technologies as photovoltaic paints to pull in solar radiation, the thermocouple effect to regulate temperature, and the thermosiphon effect to keep that temperature distributed evenly throughout the building. Dome shapes are utilized to reduce resource use and provide better protection from the elements. Homes are designed to meet the needs of the occupants rather than hobbled together as you go along. This is what true sustainable design looks like. <clears throat> Our traditional aesthetic notions of what a home should look like are simply not relevant when aiming to live a life in tandem with the surrounding environment. And as for the situation of our homes, this would be up to the individual, of course. But in order to achieve maximum sustainability, efficiency, and localization of operations, then the circular arrangement is the most equidistant and optimal for a community to adopt. The city is divided into different belts relative to functional necessity. There are recreational, energy, and agricultural belts, temporary and permanent dwelling areas. And as we move into the center of the city, there are schools, research facilities, art, music, exhibition and conference centers, childcare, distribution centers, and a hospital. All functional aspects of the city from food cultivation to sewage systems are run by a combination of autonomic sensors and a computer, computerized management system in order to maintain peak efficiency. The design is split into eights for several reasons, but one of them is so that no matter what belt you are in, you're never further away from receiving medical care than if you were in that same belt in any other section. Whereas in our system, if there's an ambulance trying to get to someone dying of a heart attack in a traffic jam, then rich or poor, I'm afraid they both stand the same chance of death. Your bank balance won't mean much to you then, I'm afraid. Inside the city, transport would be by monorail, except for emergency vehicles. And if necessary, cars could be um, booked out and returned when you finished using them. We can now build electric cars that can drive themselves, do not crash into each other, and go at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour for 200 miles with no need for recharging. But the patents for this battery technology are withheld by the automotive industry to maintain market share. Long distance travel would be by maglev trains. <clears throat> These trains are suspended on a rail by magnetism to reduce friction, and if housed in an airtight tube, they can go at speeds of up to 4,000 miles an hour safely. They are clean and use 2% the energy of planes. A health system that works to prevent rather than cure will be the main gravitas of an RBE. But what about safety from harm and crime? Well, what is most crime generated by? In a word, scarcity. If we can create an access abundance and a more equal egalitarian society, then studies show that we can get rid of most crime in the long run. <clears throat> Living arrangements and production methods would be designed in such a way so that you would not have to bear the burden of owning things. You can if you want, and in some cases it will be entirely necessary, such as underwear. <coughs> but largely, it would probably be the equivalent of hoarding shopping trolleys. The question is of utility. It's not communism, it's common sense. Ownership is an outgrowth of scarcity, and this value system that proclaims that everyone should own one of everything is childish, grossly inefficient, wasteful, and will ultimately result in ecological suicide. With nothing to own, there's nothing to steal, and no vanity can be attached to having status symbols via ownership when everyone could just get one for themselves if they really wanted to, thus decreasing the propensity for envy, shame, and ultimately violence. This, of course, brings up the human nature question. I don't want to spend too long on this topic as it's very well covered in modern scientific literature and in the first section of the uh, film Zeitgeist Moving Forward. <clears throat> uh, 
But if our nature shows one thing, it's that we're not particularly constricted by it. Um, we, we make all sorts of different um, living arrangements and, uh, in our, and showcasing our great ability to adapt to changing circumstances. So human behaviour cannot and should not be judged out the context of environmental influence. There's long been an argument of nature versus nurture going on, going on for a long time now, and only recently has it been found that it's in fact nature via nurture, not versus. Genes are not independent initiators of commands. They must be triggered by the environment to come into effect. <clears throat> Education is of the utmost importance in an RBE. The smarter our kids are, the richer we will all be. You'll be taught to stand on your own two feet, and if you want to change something in this society, then you're going to have to work for it via learning and proving that your idea works, and not just getting your own way because you have more shiny gold coins than someone else. We would raise our children to go beyond and surpass our prior societal constructs and cultural limitations. They'll be taught to understand that anything they contribute to society will be of both benefit to them and the rest of their fellow human family. Social interest must become personal interest if we wish to survive and prosper as a species on this planet. So rather than um, <clears throat> educating towards specialization for a slot in the job market of an increasingly obsolete system, we would instead emphasize a generalist point of view to promote a more comprehensive thinking pattern, whilst encouraging people's intrinsic motivations and interests to flourish. Numerous studies now show that our current methods of grades, praise, and punishment are actually detrimental towards creating intrinsic motivation, which is the origin of true creative potential problem solving and positive social skills. Human beings are biopsychosocial organisms that need more than just the basics to survive. So we must encourage our children to develop meaningful social values, positive relationships, and encourage collaboration if we would like them to grow up in a more peaceful and sustainable world. An RBE is, <clears throat> and eventually has to be, global in nature and cannot function with the price mechanism holding it back through its inherent tendency towards self-maximization, monopolistic collusion, hierarchical dominance, and scarcity-reinforcing mechanisms. Money is not a science. It's not an irrefutable law of nature. We made it up. It's a belief system, a form of faith, a religion, and not a science. Whilst it was once a useful method to manage scarcity, we've simply outgrown its usefulness. Buckminster Fuller once said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And this is exactly what we must do. We must build a socio-economic system that does away with the mechanisms that produce contrived scarcity, war, poverty, debt and servitude, and we must do this in a very real, feasible and technical way and not via some meaningless paper proclamation, political decree or set of man-made laws. Because the planet really doesn't care about the lines in the sand that we made up once upon a time called countries. In fact, it doesn't care about our existence at all. It's just a little organic synergy ball flying through space obeying the laws of nature. It's a spaceship. And when you go on a space mission, the system you employ on that shuttle is an RBE. If you use the system we currently have on board a space mission, then the astronauts would probably end up killing each other before they got off the ground. Which is effectively what we are doing by using this archaic <coughs> and outdated system here on Earth. It's time to leave the dark ages behind us and move into a new age of human flourishing and prosperity. It's not a utopia, it's just going to be a far damn sight better than what we have now. So, here comes the elephant in the room. How do we get from here to there? Or the question of transition. <clears throat> this brings us to part two, plugging into the transitional grid. As has been stated earlier, the real transition is a transition in values. Will this happen overnight? No. Are there groups out there who, whilst perhaps not aligning with our solution proposals entirely, are nonetheless seeking to address some of the important attributes we discuss? Yes. This is why the lineup for Z-Day this year is comprised of speakers from exterior organizations, to showcase the work that they are doing to help bring about the, this transition in their own way. 
At this stage, the fact that we perhaps do not agree with every aspect of what each other is talking about is superseded by the more important necessity to work together. For if any one of the organizations here today were to make progress in meeting their objectives, then this can only be a step in the right direction if you ask me. For it will only help to give people the breathing space and perspective in their lives to step back and see the systemic flaws inherent in this system and say enough is enough. Divided we're conquered, and united we kick ass. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> So let's introduce the lineup of speakers for today by aligning these organizations with an important aspect of what we address in our materials and uh, in turn metaphorically plug them into our transitional grid, if you will. Because this system is on a collision course with itself and nature in a few different ways through its inherent mechanisms, I'm afraid. <clears throat> the first is the sort of money we use. Money created out of debt via a system known as fractional, fractional reserve banking. This helps to keep everyone under pressure to turn over ever more money to keep the system going. But as we've seen, the crashes are getting closer together and the debt crisis won't go away whilst the solution is to create more money out of debt and apply interest that didn't exist in the initial loan to begin with. So let's plug our first speaker into the transitional grid, Ben Dyson, founder um, from Positive Money. Ben will talk on the immediate solutions that Positive Money are offering to address this issue. Another threat to our current socio-economic system is the displacement of humans in the job market by machines, otherwise known as technological unemployment. Technological unemployment is often referred to as the contradiction of capitalism because the market system needs people to have jobs in order to have the purchasing power to buy the goods and services for sale in the marketplace. However, if companies have to automate jobs to stay competitive, then the workers that the machines displace will not have the money to buy the goods that they're turning out. In an RBE, we of course welcome uh, mechanization of mundane, repetitive and dangerous jobs as it would free people to live the lives they want to do, while, uh, want to live rather, whilst increasing our efficiency and accuracy in the production of goods and services. <coughs> So the goal of any sane society should surely be to use technology to achieve full unemployment as quickly as possible. Not to provide people with joyless, dreary, monotonous and most likely socially meaningless job roles just to make ends meet. Let the machines do the work. That's why we create technology, to make life easier so that we can play. So let's plug our next speaker into the transitional grid, David Wood from the London Futurists and Humanity Plus who will be discussing Moore's Law, the coming singularity, and what these trends could mean for the future of the job market and our way of life in general. As we've long intuitively suspected, human beings are far healthier and happier in a more egalitarian society. But we now have the evidence to back this up. Once your country has got the basics of life taken care of, you can literally measure your social health by how equal that country is in terms of wealth distribution. <coughs> So let's plug Sean Bain, Chair of the Equality Trust, into the transitional grid to discuss the excellent work they've been doing to highlight this point and talk more about their organisation. Communication is a major part of how we perceive the world around us and informs our patterns of thought and behaviour through the command and use of language. But our language itself is in fact very old, ambiguous and riddled with higher order abstractions. They'll, this will be something we'll have to address in the future in order to communicate more clearly. But in the meantime, language, the language we do use is often used to blame, punish or incite violence rather than attempting to meet human needs. A proven tool in conflict resolution is that of non-violent communication. So our next speaker to plug into the transitional grid is Darren DeWitt from the Centre for Nonviolent <coughs> Communication. Then after lunch, We'll take a look at the difference between the law and the legal system and the ways in which we may be able to challenge the establishment without breaking the law. Laws are of course a patchwork solution for a problem that we either don't know how or are unwilling to solve. Problems equal profit. So our next speaker to plug into the transitional grid is documentary filmmaker John Webster who will talk about legal fiction and introduce you to your straw man. 
Be the light of change you want to see in the world is a quote we often use in our materials because it's the only way this transition will occur. But I think this next speaker has taken this uh, phrase to another level. So the next person to plug into the transitional grid is Mark Boyle, author of Moneyless Manifesto, founder of the Free Economy Community, otherwise known as the Moneyless Man. When joining the movement, I felt so passionately for the need to get this message out to the kids in school that I set up a website dedicated to enable members to do just that called TZM Education. If you'd like to help me in doing this, then please do visit my site and get in touch via the contact section. The second aim of this site, however, was to point out the sort of educational system we would need for the train of thought for an RBE, uh, necessary for an RBE to come to fruition. Little did I know that there was already an organisation who'd taken that aim one step further in an attempt to bring autonomy to the educational system by actually giving a voice to the people who are affected by it most, the kids. So the next dual speakers to plug into the transitional grid are Luke Flegg and Charlie Shred from the Educational Forum Change the Future. And we finish the day the way we started, by joining the dots. Undoubtedly, we all have our own ideas of how this transition will occur, but one thing's for sure. If the people and groups of good conscience and wisdom do not unite and call on each other's support to change the world for the better, then this transition is simply a pipe dream. So enter our last speaker into the transitional grid in the form of Grant Dive from the Unity website, One People, One World. And we have our plugs, or dots, if you will. Join them up, and what have you got? transition. The Zeitgeist movement ha also has exciting projects on the horizon to aid in this transition, such as the Global Redesign Institute. This will be a website launched by the movement that takes a country as a localised example of the train of thought we advocate and feeds in the data of the area based on collected statistics to prove that it can be done if the people want it. There are many seats at the table of the transition party, so please do find yours. There's room for everyone. This world-changing stuff does indeed take quite a lot of hard work and patience, I'm afraid. But anything worth doing is always hard. Updates in human values or understandings don't seem to come all that easily to us, unfortunately. This resistance to change is partly due to our egotistical tendencies. I mean, heaven forbid we should actually be wrong and learn something, eh? But it's also not helped by a system in which an established institution must remain relevant to the culture in which it exists, thus fighting any emergent understanding deemed a threat to the perpetuation of that institution. It pays in our world to say you're right, even when you're wrong. But it's in us valuing discovery with an air of humility when new evidence comes to light that we will slowly erode this tendency. This is not a political idea or some new world order Illuminati plot to take away all your stuff. And it's not some weird de death cult where you have to sacrifice a goat to Peter Joseph upon entry. <laughs> Besides, if we did make him our leader, it would only end up like this. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <coughs> It's simply a technical plan that's completely feasible if the people of the world want it. Force is simply not an option to meet these ends. Violence begets violence, and that doesn't seem like the best route to creating a peaceful world to me. Besides, on a practical level, it's not actually all that effective. The most effective route is non-violent, non-participation in this system wherever you can, and to try to live a life that is as conducive to these aims as possible whilst communicating a feasible alternative along the way. <laughs> there are no guarantees this world we speak of will come to pass, and no final frontiers if it does. If you choose to walk this path, then be prepared, because it will not be without incident. But when it boils down to it, the only relevant question to ask is whether there is a need to get from A to B. If the answer is yes, then the choice is clear. We must act. Saying I don't know where I fit into this transition yet is fine. But doing nothing when you know that something needs to be done is simply not an option when you view the world through the prism of integrity. And it is this virtue 
and whether we as individuals choose to live a life in accordance with it that will ultimately decide the collective fate of our species. For a long time now, the world's religious leaders, philosophers and writers have been proposing notions of how the world can become a more peaceful, happy and joyful place in which for us all to live. But the ability to technically achieve the abundance required for such a globally collaborative system was never a reality until now. We've achieved so much as a species and to our knowledge are the greatest evolutionary success story this universe has ever created. Quite simply, we are amazing and together there's nothing we can't achieve. We've changed before and we can do it again, but not without effort. So I'm afraid the first change has to start with you, not someone else. In the final analysis, we are one people and we share one planet. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it.